so we're going to look at some more Proverbs tonight. Um, just kind of uh, looking at different applications of, you know, the Proverbs for nowadays. Um, so the first one is Proverbs ten nineteen. It says, when there are many words, sin is unavoidable, but the one who controls his lips is prudent. Um, you, you know, sometimes, <laughs> geo whiz, sometimes the best, thing, the best thing you can do is just close your mouth, huh? <laughs> Sometimes it's the hardest thing to do, though. <laughs> and all the people who have ever had kids say, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, so, so some examples of, of how this one applies. Okay, uh, when you're dealing with kids or when you're angry or when you're, when you're trying to teach somebody um, and, and, you, and there's a lot of things that you're saying, it's probably not the best. I mean, take, for instance, when you're teaching. Um, as a pastor, you know, if you, if you preach a sermon for an hour and a half, I'm sure you have great things to say for an hour and a half, I'm sure. But I noticed that when you teach for too long, sometimes you end up saying things that you didn't even really necessarily mean to say because you're just talking so much. You know, you just, sometimes you don't really pay attention to what you're saying. Uh, when you're dealing with your kids and you're trying to teach them something or whatever, and uh, you maybe go on a rant for a bit, well, chances are you're going to end up saying something stupid or, you know, digging yourself into a grave or, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's, sometimes it's better to just, you know, say what you want to say in like a sentence or two and then just be done with it, you know, move on. Um, when you get angry, this is like one of the big things that happens when we're angry. Uh, we get mad. So that's, you know, free reign, free excuse to just <laughs> when it's best if we just, you know, when there are many words, sin is unavoidable. It's not something that is just, it's just going to happen. Um, I, I remember one time I was, I was uh, preaching. And, uh, man, I, I was real tired. I was trying to get the point across, but something popped in my head. So without thinking, I just started talking because I was so tired. And then after I said it, I was like, wait a minute, what? That's not true. No, that, that, that's, that's not right. And, uh, you know, it, it, just a good example. When there are many words, sin is unavoidable. Proverbs 10.26 says this. It says, like, oh, that's kind of small, huh? Sorry, guys. It looked, it looked bigger on my, on my monitor. Uh, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so the slacker is the one who's. Uh, I'm sorry. So the slacker is to the one who sends him on an errand. Another word for slacker would be a lazy person or, uh, yeah, the lazy person. Um, so some examples of that is when you hire someone that is lazy. First off, they do their job very poorly, and so not only does that reflect off, back on you, but then it, it makes more problems that you have to resolve. You know what I mean? So let's say you're running um, uh, construction. There's something I used to do. Let's say you're working construction, and hey, um, go unload the truck. So then they go, and they don't unload the, unload the truck the whole way. Or you know, maybe they were speeding and driving the trailer too too fast at fish sales. You know, or maybe they're going too slow and they don't get back for like four hours. And it's like, how long does it take you to go to the dump and unload the trailer? You know, um, just ex examples like that. They do the job poorly. And, you know, it's like smoke in your eyes. It's just another annoyance. If you've ever been in charge of a project and you've had a lazy worker, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so you, you, another thing is you have to keep checking on people who are lazy, right? Because you can't just tell them what to do and they'll get it done. Like you can trust them. They will get it done. No, it's not like that. You tell them what to go and what, and what to do. Maybe if you're lucky, they might have started on it. You know, they don't finish the tasks that you set them to do. Um, and the same thing happens with kids too. Um, they don't. They some a lot of times when you ask a lazy person to do something, they don't do it the way that you wanted it done. You know what I mean? They just kind of do it maybe the fast way, or oh, it made more sense to me to do it this way. It's like that actually happens quite a bit when you're doing a job that you know how to do, and you hire a new person who does has no idea they don't have the experience you have, and you ask them to do something, then they say, you know, it really made more sense. So I did this way instead. It's like, well, yes, and I understand why you would have done that, but now it's a bigger mess that i got to clean up. You know what I mean? It's smoke in your eyes. Um, another thing is lazy people typically don't know how to interact with other people, so they go around just irritating people. They irritate your clients. They irritate you. <laughs> they irritate other workers. Um, you know, you set them to the job, and, you know, before long, everybody at the job site is fighting. You're like, what is going on? Um, you have to follow behind them and double check everything. They're, they follow their own time frame. They have no concept of time. They have no concept of trying to benefit the boss. You know, it's not about benefiting the boss. They are not there to benefit the boss. They are there to get money. That's it, you know. 
Um, and whenever you have somebody who is just, well, I guess the two kind of go hand in hand. Lazy people are only concerned about what's in it for me. And I get, I get my paycheck, I go home, you know, and then they spend it on themselves. They don't have any savings account to speak of because they don't know how to, how to do their money. They're just all about me, 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 me. So they're not there to benefit other people. Um, they follow their own time frame. They don't do it to benefit you. Uh, people who hire their kids, this is a great example, when people hire their kids instead of the one who would do a good job. If, jo if your kid will do a good job, hire them. That's fine. But I've seen a lot of people who hire their kids when their kids are not good workers. A great example of this is we were doing, building a house up, uh, I guess it was uh, Cedar Crest, I guess, uh, maybe somewhere around there. And uh, the, the, the guy we were building the house for was like this, I don't know, millionaire or something, you know, you know kind of how they are. You know, they think that they own the world and stuff. They kind of have a pain in the butt to do it. It was fine, though. I mean, you just do your job and you let them talk and you just kind of ignore them and tune them out. And you, you get along fine. Um, but uh, he, he brought his, his son by to help. And we were professionals. We knew what we were doing. <laughs> and this guy was not. I mean, he was one of those guys that went to the gym every day but didn't really know how to use his muscles. You know what I mean? So when it was like coming to the simplest of things, like standing a wall, for instance, all you do is you, you pick up the two by fours and you push them up. Like, that's it. It's not a complicated task. And, uh, you know, oh, 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 it's like, you got these huge muscles. You could probably take me out in a fight. We're lifting a wall. It's not rocket science. And uh, that, that's a good example where you hire your kids for something that, that they're just not, they're not good at. They're not doing a good job. But, oh, it's my kid, so I have to show this loyalty to them or something and continue to give excuses for their poor work ethic. You know what I mean? And uh, so, I mean, you can do that if you want. But remember this. Smoke to the eyes. <laughs> remember that. If you want to hire a lazy person because they're a relative, you go right ahead. Smoke to the eyes. Um, the next one. <coughs> uh, 1028. Uh, the hope of the righteous is joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. And the basic idea of this is, Sometimes we think that if, I, if I'm a good person, I'll get whatever I want, and bad people don't get what they want. That's not really what this proverb is saying. It's actually saying because the righteous have their hopes set on the things above, you know, heavenly things. So instead of focusing on getting that really nice car, having that, ho that house that they, that they really want, that $500,000 house that they really want, instead, they're focused on the heavenly home, the eternal home. And so in that way, the hope of the righteous is joy. They've got nothing but good things to look forward to. It doesn't matter what happens. They've got something to look forward to. But the expectation of the wicked will perish. Even if they finally get that money that they want, it'll never be enough money. Even if they get the house that they want, it, it won't be good enough. It, it won't satisfy their, in, their soul. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be like, uh, like rotting meat. You know, it's, it's not something that is going to sustain them for a long period of time. Um, so 1114. Without guidance, a people will fall. But with many counselors, there is deliverance. Now, this is, this is one, I think, that has a lot of applications that we just don't really listen to because we like to do things our own way. <laughs> we don't really like to ask other people their advice. When we say, oh, what's God's will for my life? We, we don't ever say, you know, hey, what do you think I'd be good at? You know, and we, we go and talk to people. No, 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 no. We, we, we lock ourselves away and turn it into this mystical thing of God's will for my life. And uh, we, we ignore what the Bible says. We ignore wisdom. We ignore the advice of others. I remember there was this one person who, uh, it was in college, and, you know, young and arrogant, which was fine. I mean, we're all young and arrogant in college. You, you guys remember being 18, right? Young and arrogant. I mean, that's just perfect, perfect summary. And uh, they had it set in their mind that they were going to be a social worker, which was fine. But the problem is, they didn't like kids. And I was just thinking, how in the world is that going to work? Y you have to at least like them a little bit to work with them. When you, especially when you're dealing with like at-risk teens. I mean, that's just, yeah, they're going to be a pain in the butt. Like, you have to be okay with that. Like, they're not going to be perfectly mild-mannered, you know. It's, it's not going to happen. And uh, I remember there was this other guy that I was in college with. And uh, he, he had the pastor look down. I mean, he had the clothes. He had the sharp looking glasses. He, he looked right. He even looked down on people the perfect way. You know, just like, I'm so much better than you. And, uh, you know, he was convinced he was going to go lead the next mega church. I, I don't even know if he got in ministry at all. You know what I mean? Like without guidance, the people will fall instead of thinking you're hot, you're hot snot. 
maybe the better option is to, you know, get other people's advice and counsel on things before you go for it. So um, you have plans for your family or for your work or, or for your ministry or for, your, for the church or whatever. Get advice and input from others. It doesn't matter what it is. Get advice and input from others. Oh, I love this girl. I think I'm going to marry her. What do other people think of her? See what I mean? Love is blind. We sometimes get with people, oh, they're the greatest thing in the world. Uh, my first girlfriend was like that when I was a, te a teenager. She was the best thing in the world, I was convinced. Meanwhile, everybody else in, in, in my entire, I, 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 I didn't have a single person who said, hey, that's a good relationship, or hey, that's a good person to get with. Nobody said that. Literally nobody. Not even my friends were saying that. They were just keeping quiet about it. See what I mean? Nobody thought it was a good idea. I thought it was the best thing in the world because you're young and you're dumb, right? But then as I got older and I got space from it, I was like, wow, what was I thinking? That was not smart. Um, she was bitter. Her mom was just a nuisance and a half, and, and they were always around each other. That would have been a train wreck. Uh, you know, and uh, she was really self-absorbed and stuff, and, and it wasn't like a give-and-take kind of relationship. You know what I mean? Like, now that I'm older, I'm looking back, and I'm like, oh, wow, what was I thinking? You know, but at the time... And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Whenever you're trying to lead something forward, you need the advice and counsel of others. You, you can't just back yourself in a corner and say, nope, I know what I'm doing. I don't need anybody else. I mean, come on. You do need other people. Don't, don't, don't be arrogant about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, make sure that the guides that you get are proven. So some good examples. <coughs> some good examples of that. You're starting a business. Probably a good guide to get would be an, a business entrepreneur. Somebody who's been there, who knows what they're talking about, right? Uh, you're wanting to get into ministry. Maybe talk to a pastor. You're wanting to, uh, you know, whatever. Maybe talk to a psychologist or talk to, talk to somebody who's parented before or so on and so forth. You want to be a social worker? Talk to somebody who's been a social worker. You know, find a guide for you, a coach for you to get better, learn how to be better, but from people who actually know what they're talking about. I know a lot of people who can give me a lot of advice on a lot of different things, but that doesn't mean that they actually know what they're talking about. It just means that they know how to talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, that's one thing you got to always watch out for is, uh, you know, am I getting advice? And what are, what are my advice sources? So whenever you're going up to make, to make this, you know, big decision in your life, whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is, you're, you're going to make a big decision, get advice from other people. Don't try to do it yourself. You don't have to prove how great you are by figuring out yourself. Amateurs figure it out themselves. Professionals get coached. I mean, look at professional league, right? What happens when they, when, they hit, uh, when they hit a rock wall? They get a trainer. These are professionals getting a trainer. See what I mean? When, you're, when you want to be a musician, you go and take lessons. Amateurs figure it out themselves. Professionals get coaching. So if you want to be a top-tier parent, a top-tier leader, a top-tier pastor, minister, uh, food pantry worker, uh, you know, whatever you guys have got going on in your lives, figure out somebody who's been there and can really help you. See what I mean? Because they will take you to the next level, and that, that's what you want to do. I mean, you don't want to be left right where you are, right? If I'm doing the same job now as I am in two years, I got a problem. I should be growing. Like, it's okay to mess up, but you do need to be headed forward somewhere. You know what I mean? But for a lot of us, we live the same circle in our life over and over again. That's just a terrible place to be stuck at. Stuck at. You don't want to be the same parent today as you were five years ago. That's just that's, that's a terrible mistake. So uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 11.15 says, If someone puts up security for a stranger, he will suffer for it, but the one who hates such agreements is protected. So a good example of putting up security for a stranger, uh, think co-signing a loan. Yeah, it would be a good example of that. Um, if, if you know the person and you know the character, that's just as bad. Because what happens is we do something like this. Well, it's my daughter. You see where the problem is, right? If they were mature and responsible with money, they probably wouldn't need you to co-sign the loan. Let's just be real, okay? Just look at the problem honestly. Usually, people who are good with their money don't need people to co-sign for loans because their credit score is higher, they have the money set aside, so on and so forth. They don't buy stuff on a whim. They don't buy stuff that they can't afford. Not always, but usually. So then, right there, a red flag, somebody's asking you to co-sign for a loan. That's the first red flag. And then the second red flag is, what is their history? So is this a person who typically misses payments, or do they make payments, or you know, what's their history financially? Well, what are we talking about? Now remember, with Proverbs, it's, we're not talking about what is a sin and what is not a sin. Proverbs doesn't tell us much about what is a sin. 
it tells us about the difference between wisdom and foolishness. I gave you this example a couple of weeks ago when we talked about it the first time. Is it wrong for me to go on a date with a girl? No. Is it wrong for me to go on a date with a girl at night? No. Is it wrong for me to go on a date with a girl at night, you know, in a dark alley? No, but things are getting pretty sketchy. The difference between right and wrong and wisdom and foolish. Proverbs tells us what's wise and what's foolish. Are you going to go to hell for co-signing alone? No. But if you co-sign alone, you will suffer for it, and the one who hates such agreements is protected. So you won't have that protection if you're doing that. See what I mean? You're going to put yourself in a coffin of your own make. I mean, you can do it if you want. But what we do is we say, okay, so that says about a stranger. So if I know the person, that's better. No, no, no. If you know the person, that's just as bad because now you've got a political drama, right? You co-sign for your daughter or for your son. Boy, that's going to blow up in your face. And you know that's true. Yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Uh, and then they'll take it out on you, you know. You're, you're going to be the bad guy. It's like, oh, great. Um, it, it's not an issue of sin or not, but it's an issue of foolishness or wisdom. Um, so it, here at the church, between one to five people, every day between one to five people, every single day, that's seven days a week. Okay, I'm not joking. Every single day, one to five people come by that church, and they come by and they knock. Okay, we open up the door. And they say almost the exact same thing. It, it, it's, it's uncanny. It's just almost the exact same story every time. We're traveling from California to Tennessee. We're running out of gas. Can you give us gas for money for gas? Okay, hey, you should have probably planned your route ahead of time, saved your money. B, you probably should have gotten a job and earned the money and then saved the money. And then C, how is it the church's job to cover for your irresponsibility? Did I miss something here? We're seeking the loss, not, not helping people who have no financial discretion. You know, like that's not what the church is here for. And did you know that the grand majority of them get mad when we say, I'm sorry, we don't give cash, cash assistance. At the gas station, they oftentimes will, will give people um, money if you want to try that. You know, they, they oftentimes get mad at us. It is evidently our job to help them. Okay, so let's do math. If each of those people wants twenty dollars of gas, which they never want, just twenty dollars of gas, especially with inflation. So let's 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 just say twenty. Twenty times five is okay. Now one hundred times how many days in a month are there? Thirty. You're seeing how expensive this is getting, right? This is not a, this is not a workable solution. This is we're talking about thousands of dollars spent on other people, and that's not including word of mouth. When people hear that you give away cash assistance, that number goes up, which means now there's people who can't make their, their rent that want it to be your problem. That's not responsible. So God says, here, I am entrusting this money to you. Reach the lost. And we turn around and say, nope, we're not going to reach the lost with it. We're going to cover a bunch of irresponsible people. No. Then God removes the blessing, and we won't have the money to help the lost anymore. That's how it works. That's how, what Proverbs says. That's what the whole rest of the Bible says. God is not a fool. We act foolish. God does not have to condone that foolishness with, be like, oh, you're going to act like an idiot? I guess I have, to, I have to cover you because you're standing in faith. Like, that's not faith. That's just stupidity. And uh, so, okay, if you, if you did it for every single one, the, the church would be shut down next month. And uh, be good stewards, exactly. And... and <coughs> Well, anyways, you get what I'm saying. And that, that's even assuming that they aren't lying anyways. I mean, this story kind of sounds like a lie, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they, maybe, maybe they are all going from California to Tennessee. Maybe. You never know. You never know. So if their story, right? Tennessee is going to be packed with Californians. <laughs> with Californians. Uh. So is it a sin if I give them money? No, it's not a sin if I give them money. Is it foolish to give them money? Yes. It is foolish to squander God's blessings to me. There are others who need it more. So I've got five kids and a wife. Right? Who is my first responsibility to provide for? My family. But see, to them, it's, no, 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 that's not good enough. I should give from and let my children go without food, I guess. See what I mean? That, that, that doesn't sound good to me. 
Right. Like, so my kids have to suffer because of your lack of planning. That's 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 a fantasy plan. Like, I'm responsible to my to my to my family. Like, I got to provide for them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And some people are gonna get mad at that, but it's not. It's not really my problem for if they get me. You get what I'm saying? I, I'm not saying this in a mean way. Listen, listen to what I'm trying to say. It's not my problem how other people react. You know what I mean? I do the right thing. I do it with a good attitude. I don't yell and scream at them. You idiot, you should have gotten a job. I, I don't do that. I talk to them with respect. I talk nice to them, but I'm still not going to give them their, give them money. That doesn't mean I don't love them. That doesn't mean I don't care. Like, I'm really sorry, dude, but you did get in a car ride with zero money. It is kind of on you. Like, I do care. Really, I do, but I can't provide for everything that I care about. There's a bunch of dogs at the animal shelter, too. I can't afford more than one dog. So I don't have more than one dog. See how that works? <laughs> I don't just keep taking in dogs because I feel sorry for them. I don't have the money to provide for more than one dog, so I don't. That's, I know my budget, and that's why I'm not in debt. Guess how much school loans I own? Car loans? I, I don't, I don't. My house is on a personal lease with the owner. I don't even have a mortgage out with that. And I only owe $42,000 for it. It's not like I owe ooh, that much. Like. I could get approved for a loan with the bank like this because I have great credit score because I pay off my credit cards every month. I do not carry a balance on my credit cards. That's wisdom. They are paying me to use their cards. See, it only pays if I keep the balance on there, then they charge me interest. But if I pay off the credit card each month, they pay me to use their card. See how that works? It's, it's a wonder when you, when you don't live in debt, like you, you, money comes out of everywhere. But when you, when, you don't, when you don't know what to do with your money, it's a constant burden. Why, why don't we always have, why don't people feel sorry for us? Why don't, and you live your whole life as a victim. And they, I mean, you can do that once again, but I've got to think about my kids. I got to think about my kids. Like I'm not going to be here for forever. If I die right now today, are my kids going to be, you know, down the crapper or are they going to have some kind of a plan, you know? So 1127, so okay, if someone puts up security for a stranger, he will suffer for it, but the one who hates such agreements is protected. Uh, 1127, the one who searches for what is good seeks favor, but if someone looks for trouble, it will come to him. Now, this is one of those proverbs where I understood the singing part, if someone looks for trouble, it will come to him. Yeah, that just makes sense. You go around picking a fight, you're going to find a fight, right? I mean, like, would well, that make sense? It's the first part that I didn't quite get. The one who searches for what is good seeks favor. And let me try and break it down. So we'll start off with the second half. Complaining or nitpicking, you only see the bad. When you are someone who complains about everything, you're only going to see the, see the bad in every situation. That's, a, that's the first thing to say about that. Um, but then another thing of that is when you do things that are stupid, you're going you're gonna to deal with the consequences of that. Like one thing that you see is, I'm going to cheat on my spouse and no one will know. It'll be our secret. Okay. I don't think anyone ever has gotten away with adultery. I could be wrong, but I don't think that has ever happened. I mean, you can't even get away with looking at porn for very long. You're going to get caught. Like, you know, eventually it's just a matter of time. It's like a ticking bomb. Uh, the only thing is, are you going to die first or is she going to find out first? But as far as to my knowledge, I've never heard of a guy getting away with it. Because even if she didn't find out, which I've never heard of that happen, but let's just pretend like she didn't. Um, you, you don't feel good about it. It's not like you're sitting there like, ha ha, my life's going pretty great. I'm sitting with four different girls. No, it, it, it's not like that. In your head, it's like that. Oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to get the best of both worlds. It, it's never like that, though. And then there's jealousy that starts kicking in. Even if you've deadened yourself emotionally and you can just go around sleeping with people, eventually her jealousy will start kicking in, right? I mean, it's going to happen. Like, I'm going to tell your wife. and it, It's going to happen. Like, it's just a matter of time. It's not something where it's like, you know, get out of jail free thing. Um, so, no, it, it will change you and bad things will come from it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, dude, for real. And I don't know how, but like they have like this secret code. Like I think I think they send radio signals, you know. Like let's say, 
Le, le, yeah. And they do that kind of stuff because this is what happens, okay? Let's say, for instance, your wife always gets off at work at 8 o'clock. So you decide to cheat on her at 6 o'clock. That's going to be the day somehow. Somehow, that's going to be the day she comes home at 6 o'clock. I'm telling you, plans don't go according to plan when it's evil. I'm telling you, bro. Never works out. So another good example of this proverb, obviously, is that if you look for, if you look for a fight, you're going to find one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But um, the, you could also say that if you look for good in a person or a situation, you're going to find favor. You're going to find favor. And that's what that person, first part means. The one who searches for what is good seeks favor. So, okay, let's say we're in a really bad situation here. Okay, let's say we are all, all of us together, each one of us is going through the exact same situation. It's a terrible situation. Like maybe we, we all work at the same place and our boss is like, things are not going well. Okay, things are just not going well. So we're all in the same boat, okay? And you've got, let's say Ray is, is just a negative person. He's always complaining about everything. But then let's say that Kathy uh, is just always looking for the good in the situation, always encouraging people. Well, which one is going to find favor in your eyes? Well, probably Kathy, right? That's kind of a part of, what, part of what this proverb is saying. The one who searches for what is good, they, they seek favor. That, that, that's the way it's going to go for them. Um, and, but if someone looks for trouble, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come, come to him. So, so let's give, give an example here. The church goes through a hard time, and someone who tries to find the good uh, and to encourage others with, uh, w with all that, they find favor. But the one who is never satisfied and always complains, always nitpicking, uh, you know, Damien, you didn't do your job very good, you know. Uh, you, you did a terrible job with, uh, let's say you were doing the tables. You did a terrible job with the tables. And uh, Danny, I can't believe that, you, you know, you, so on and so forth. Uh, so that one who's never satisfied, it's gonna, they're going to weigh other people down. And then people are going to be cursing them under their breath. There is something else I need to say about this, though, and that's this. Beware when there is a sweet talker. Um, corrupt people will oftentimes use charisma to gain your favor. And Proverbs also has another proverb where it talks about that. You can trust the wounds from a friend, but, you know, the many kisses of an enemy are, you know. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Just because somebody has charisma and they talk real nice doesn't necessarily mean that you should trust them. You got to let people stand the test of time. Let people trust us, stand the test of time. So uh, let's look at uh, another one here. And we're getting towards the end. If it would stop skipping five pages at a time, uh, Proverbs 12 10 says, The righteous cares about his animal's health, but even the merciful acts of the wicked are cruel. Now, this is what people kind of think it's good to take care of animals. And that's not necessarily bad, but that's not what the proverb is saying. Here in Otero County, I don't know about the rest of the world, but, but here, this is what people do. First off, they take in a bunch of pets that they can't afford instead of supplying for their family. That's the first thing that they do. Every, everybody in Otero County does. I don't know why, but everybody does it. They'll have 10, 12 dogs, but, you know, they won't have enough gas to have a job. You know, they, they won't. But some, I, to me, that seems really irresponsible because not only are you not providing for yourself or your, for your family, but you are kind of putting those dogs in a bad situation. Those dogs don't need you. Like, you need those dogs more than they need you. So you're keeping something for an emotional attachment that you can't really, can't really afford. So that's the first thing that people do out here. And it, it seems like everybody out here does that. The second thing, if they're not doing that, they're doing this. They're, they're, they give their money and their time to animal causes and ignore human suffering. Like, for instance, oh, there's this PETA thing or whatever that, that's, that's going to save however many um, cats or whatever from being put down. I'm not, I'm not for animal cruelty, obviously, but when you have an excess population of any animal, the responsible thing is to kind of lower their numbers. Rat, cats actually have, I don't know if you guys know this, but cats have a similar um, effect on an environment as, as a large population of rats do. They work like a plague. Um, they kill everything off, and they make it where things don't grow as they should because a cat's you know, urine and stuff will oftentimes be poisoned to different plants. When you have an excess cat population, usually the environment suffers for it. The wise thing to do in such a situation would be to kind of thin it down a little bit. Once again, I'm not for hurting animals, but it's the same thing. They got a bunch of pigs that are coming in from the northeast, 
uh, of the U.S., an overpopulation of pigs, the correct measure is to kind of thin the herd a little bit. They're, they're, they're killing livestock. They're killing pets. They're attacking people. I mean, this isn't like a good situation. This is, this is a bad situation. The responsible thing is to, to thin it out. But with that being said, um, people either will have a bunch of pets that they can't afford or they'll, um, they'll ignore human suffering and, oh, you know, my sweet baby precious, and then they'll pay for the, for the animal things. Um, and here's the thing that I, that the issue, why this is an issue is because basically what they're saying without saying it is that human life is not more special than animal life. But from a biblical perspective, that's not true. So, for instance, Jesus said, you know, I, I care for the birds. They, 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 they are provi I provide for them. I care for them. But is not your life more than theirs? Jesus himself, and unless you're going to say that Jesus isn't God, which now we have a problem because now we're talking theology, which is not good. Jesus is God, and God himself said, yes, I care for the animals, but... You are more than them. You are worth more than them. Your value is higher. So when you have kids dying in the street in places like Ethiopia, and then you have a dog fair, it just doesn't really seem like a very righteous thing to do to give to all the animals so we can have a surplus population. We're not talking about saving a species that's dying out. We're talking about an overpopulation versus children who are dying in Ethiopia. I mean, it kind of seems like not even a fair contest. In my eyes, and I really think the Bible does too, so I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. But what this proverb is actually saying is not saying righteous people have animals that they care for. That's not what it's saying about it at all. So let's, let's break this down. First off, <coughs> a righteous person cares for his entire household, even the least important of the household. What is the least important of, of, of a righteous person's household? The animals. The most important is your spouse, and then your kids, then your servants. Or in our modern day, we don't have servants, so it would be uh, your, the, your, your employees. And then it would be your livestock. People always take precedence over animals. So what this power is saying is the righteous person cares for even the least of their household. But the best that a wicked person can do is still heartless. See, Jesus says that from what's in the inside, it inevitably comes out. And it doesn't just come out in our words. It also comes out in our actions. You see a lot of people, for instance, who are lazy, and they will have animals, but they'll be too tired and depressed and whatever to go out and feed their animals. So their animals will be malnourished. Or clean up after them. Okay, so now these are very important points. Um, and so... You know, so then they do something like, oh, I got them another chew toy. But it's like, but they aren't getting fed. See you know what I mean? The merciful acts of the wicked are, are cruel. But the righteous person cares for even the least of their household. See, it's, it's a contrast here. The, the, the best that a wicked can do, person can do is still not good. And that's, that's kind of the idea. So an application of this proverb, if you serve God, provide and care for those who are under your care. Even those who you deem as unimportant, provide for those who are under your care. That would be a good application of this proverb. If you say that you love God, provide for those who are under your care. That's why I choose my wife and kids over the five people who come by a day for gas money because they don't know how to plan. That's why. Because I take care of my household. This is what Proverbs is teaching. So um, that takes us to 12.15. This will be the last proverb we look at tonight. Uh, a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. I mean, let's be honest. How many times do you want to do something so you don't, you kind of separate yourself from other people? Because you want to do what you want to do, and you don't want to hear what they have to say about it. Or, you know, uh, <clears throat> you, uh, you make a decision, you're kind of hesitant to tell people about it. You know what I mean? You separate yourself from others, and you don't tell people about it. When we, we have this amazing, uncanny ability, all of us, we can convince ourselves of anything. Anything. Uh, one thing, for instance, people who look for signs. God, show me a sign. If, if this is what you want me to do, let this happen. Those people will always be looking for another sign. It'll never be enough to have a sign. They'll always look for more signs and more signs and more signs. And then some of their signs will affirm what they want, and some of their signs will 
you know, con contradict what they want. And uh, it's just one of those things. We can think we are more righteous and separate ourselves from everyone else because they're toxic, which is how we typically do things. Um, but listening to the input of others is, is wiser. It's easy to say, well, they're just toxic. People do that all the time, right? Like, I, I, they're just tearing down my hopes and dreams. Like, they don't really care about me. They're just toxic. And uh, really what they mean to say is, I, I really don't want to uh, have their input. Even your enemy who hates you will say things that you can learn from. You know, uh, when, you're, when they're like, you know, you, you're going to be terrible at that. And you're like, hey, that's mean. God, to toxic. I was like, well, stop and think about that. Are you going to be bad at that job? You know what I mean? If you hate cats or if you're allergic to cats and you're getting a job at a cat, cat shelter, I mean, that's a good example of something you might not be very good at. Uh, maybe get something that doesn't involve cats if you're allergic to cats. I mean, that would be what I would do. Um, I, I'm scared to death of heights, so I'm not going to be working for the electric company climbing up the poles. I'm not, not going to do that. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm like... You go ahead and do that. Uh, I'll find some other means to keep myself, you know, occupied. <laughs> the whole Damien thing with jumping with the with the parachutes. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Like, I don't need that in my life. Um, so before you make big decisions, really talk. Really talk. What does my spouse think about this? And be careful, because sometimes your spouse will do this cloak and dagger nonsense where they'll say, oh, I don't care, whatever you want. It's a trap. Amen. It's a trap. Okay? Amen. They do care. When they say that, don't make any decision. Just hold off a couple days and then just watch and observe. And eventually the one in there is going to say, so what would you do about that? It's Here comes the moment of truth. And if you can say, oh, you know, it didn't sound like you were too into that. Then they're going to say, oh, crisis averted. You still have a home with a loving wife. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Now, uh, what, do, what do wise people that I know think? Have wise people in your life that you can go to. You know, not, not, not your drinking buddies. Not, not your friends that, you know, you go and you get your nails done. And you go, oh, he just, doesn't, he just doesn't appreciate you, girlfriend. You know, not, not those kinds of people. I mean wise people in your life. People who know what they're talking about, who've been around the block a couple times. If your wise person is under 50 years old, you have to stop and seriously consider if they actually are wise. If your wise person is in serious amounts of debt, you have to seriously consider this person might not be wise. If this wise person has their family life in shambles, divorced, kids in the system, all kinds of different stuff, that's not necessarily a red flag, but it might be, definitely might be. I know, I know in life crap happens. I know that. I understand. But you still need to take inventory. What kind of a person am I, am I getting advice from? Uh, if I'm going to get marital advice, I'm not going to get ask somebody who, who's bitter, been married four or five times. Oh, you just leave her. And it's just going to happen anyways. Like, oh, okay. You know, I'm not going to listen to that guy, right? I mean, think about it. The person you're going to pretend like your life is important, because it is. And then say, hmm, if, if my life was a Fortune 500 company, who would I ask to help me keep this company from, from bankruptcy? How much more should you take care for your own life than a Fortune 500 company? And, and then start from there. So that's a, that's a good, that's a good stopping, or starting place there. But, um, and the next thing is, okay, so what does my spouse think? What does a wise person think? Does their advice match up with Scripture? For instance, you know, I, I think that God's calling me to move to Florida. Okay, to do what? I don't know. Do you have a job lined up? No. Do you have money set aside for a move? No. Then should I move? No. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, this is a terrible idea. If, I, if God really is calling me there, he will open up doors. He will show me something. But he's not just going to be like, you have a feeling. Therefore, that feeling must be the Holy Spirit. It's, no. It, God's not going to advise you to do something stupid. Yeah. Um, and so what some people do is they take scripture out of context. So uh, I knew one guy who was, who was, um, who was dating this, this, this girl, and uh, he was talking about the way that Christians should love. 
And I told him, I said, yes, but you're not married, first off. And second off, this person's not a Christian, and you are. And third off, it's not not loving somebody to admit that you're not attracted to them. Like, if you're dating someone and you're not attracted to them, that's not being unloving. It's a fact. You're not attracted to them. You're not, there's nothing tying it on yet. Like, it's, it's, it's okay to walk away at this point. You know what I mean? Like, there's no commitment. And, uh, well, um, another example is uh, the righteous will live by faith. So, a lot of times I hear people use this verse to say something like this. Well, if I'm walking in faith, I'm going to trust in God. And it's like, well, yes, 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 yes. But trusting in God and walking in faith isn't acting foolishly. See, if I have to ignore the entire book of Proverbs because I'm walking in faith, it's probably not walking in faith. Going back to co-signing on a loan since we already talked about it. Well, you know, um, I really feel like God's leading me to co-sign on this loan. But the book of Proverbs alone tells us multiple times not to do it. So probably that's a no. Um, you know, when the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked, it's not just talking about with marriage. It's talking about with business, too. Don't go into business with somebody who's not a Christian. Don't sign a house agreement with somebody who's not a Christian. Don't, you know, yes, obviously don't marry somebody who's not a Christian. All these different examples. Don't be yoked unequally. And that, that's a good thing to follow. It's going to constantly, you know, be something that comes back in your face. Um, so people ask us all the time, well, well, should I date this person or whatever? What does Scripture say? What does Scripture say? Um, and I already talked about how it's not unloving to admit, you know, if you are incompatible with somebody or if you're not attracted to somebody. Um, another thing, you're, you're wanting to date somebody. What do pastors think? These are people who, who counsel people who have made bad decisions frequently. Most of the problems, that, and what I mean by that is most of the counseling that a pastor does, I know from experience, is when people have done a bunch of, a series of things that they knew was wrong, and then they, the lines kind of got blurred and they got confused, and then they got so lost that they don't even know in their own head that they don't even know which way is up anymore. And so at that point is when they come to a pastor for counseling. See what I'm saying? So with that in mind, you know, these are people who, who deal with that quite frequently. What, 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 what does a pastor think? Hey, I don't like that pastor. Fine, go to a different pastor. Like, it's fine. Like, it's not going to hurt my feelings. I more want to see people, you know, get out of the, debt, the, the ditch that they're in. Um, let, let's wrap things up here. What do people think who have been there and done that? If you want to buy a good bicycle, who are you going to ask? Are you going to ask me who rides them all the time, or are you going to ask my mom who hasn't ridden one in 25 years? I tell you, I know a lot about bikes. You want to ride a bike? You want to own a bike? And I'm not talking about a motorcycle. I'm talking about a bicycle. You want to buy a bicycle? I'm the person to ask. I know what I'm talking about. You want to buy a motorcycle? Probably shouldn't ask me. I don't know anything. I can tell you it has two wheels and a motor. That's about it. I can't tell you much anything else. And uh, th that's just kind of what I'm talking about. You know, a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. Listen to people. So, um, as we, as we end here, one thing that I think is kind of important <coughs> is how Proverbs applies to finding God's will for your life. So w what is God's will for your life? Not God, should I do this or that? What we do is we go and we look for like an either or kind of answer. God, should I do this or this? And very rarely will God call us to one specific thing. I'll give you a good example. God calls Paul into ministry, right? The book of Acts calls him into ministry. Does he tell him where to go? Nope. Does not tell him where to go. He tells him to be a missionary. So he goes as a missionary. It's only, and I believe his second or third missionary journey, when he just decides, I think I'm going to go over to this province. And God intervenes and tells him, no, don't go there. Go here instead. That was the only time. Before that, it was just God told him to go, and so he went. Sometimes we want God to, to guide our feet in like a predestined path of there's only one correct trail. And oftentimes, God has lots of different possible ways for you forward. See what I mean? I, for instance, I could step down from ministry in total where I do not do ministry at all, and I wouldn't be living in sin unless God specifically told me, do not step down from ministry. Then it would be sin. See the difference? Or let's say I say, you know, uh, 
I don't really want to be a worship pastor anymore. I want to kind of, uh, I want to work in the food pantry. Am I sinning? No. No. Unless God specifically said, keep doing worship or don't do food pantry. See how it works? When you have something on your heart and you think it might be a good thing, pray about it by, by all means, but don't be so afraid to make a mistake that you're not willing to do anything. I might not be doing God's will, so I'm not going to do anything. Well, I can guarantee you it's not God's will for you to sit on your butt and do nothing. I, can, I promise you. I promise you. Um, God has things out there, and he's, it says here continually about how God has called us to do good works. So if you want to know what, God, what God's will for, is for your life, find somewhere where you can serve somebody. That's simple. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be the biggest thing in the world. You don't have to get global recognition. You don't have to build your brand. You don't have to have 5,000 Facebook likes. You don't have to have any of that. You just have to have an obedient heart. And something a pastor once told me, it was a district and, and a superintendent, uh, Mike Dickinson, he said, I don't know if I believe that somebody can miss out on God's will so long as they're seeking him. And it's not going to be something you just accidentally stumble past it. Every time I've heard of, some, heard of somebody legitimately disobeying God, it's because God specifically told them something and they specifically did not listen. A great example of this, and you, you can talk to him yourself, is my dad. So God, God tells him to go to Africa to be a, uh, either a missionary or a Bible school teacher. You know, I don't quite remember because we didn't do that. So he disobeyed. He knew God wanted him to do something and he didn't do it. See what I mean? As far as I know, God never told him whereabouts in Africa to go. What happens is we make decisions in our life of, of obeying God. And God just has a way of obeying our, not obeying, guiding, of guiding our paths. And, you know, just getting us in the right place. I don't know exactly how it works, but, you know. So instead of, God, should I do this thing or that thing? A, a better thing to ask God is, Lord, give me wisdom. Is it wiser for this or that? Is it wiser for me to do this or that? And I think that there's a lot more there because as you're reading in Scripture, he'll start showing you things. In scripture, I'll give you a really good example. I really thought for sure that I was called to go to Georgia to do this thing, uh, the state. Georgia is the state, not the, not the country. Uh, and uh, so I quit my job and moved out there with no plan, and I stood on faith. No, no. What I did is I thought I was. I thought God wanted me to do that, so I put in for it. I put my 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 resume in, and then I waited. I figured if it was God, they would hire me, and if it wasn't, they wouldn't. And so they didn't. So it wasn't God. Problem solved. See how that works? And now is my family suffering because of my lack of financial wisdom? No. They're still provided for. We still have our house. We're not out on the streets. <laughs> See what I mean? Obey God, yes, but keep in mind that you can make mistakes. There's going to be times in life when you think, oh, this is God, and you're going to be wrong. This is why it's important to read your Bible, stay in prayer. Talk to other Christians. Talk to pastors. Because you can fully convince yourself of something that's not true. It's possible. It happens all the time. So, uh, you know, in, in, instead, of, instead of trying to find that one path for your foot and not to stray any bit, try to do things that are wise and good. And God will just have a way of getting you where you need to go. And if you're heading in the right direction and you're really genuinely seeking him, he'll intervene. He'll intervene. The, 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 the thing is, make sure that you aren't getting hard-hearted. That's the thing you got to watch out for. When God says something, you do it. You know what I mean? And a good way of knowing of that is where are you at right now? Are you at a place where you can, where you're obeying him in the things you already know to do? You know how many times I hear people say, God, speak to me about this, but then they're disobeying him in the things that they already knew. You know what I mean? There, I've talked to numerous, numerous teenagers who they're in a relationship that they shouldn't be, Christian with non-Christian, and they're sleeping around. And so they say, God, show me your world. Do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do this? And, and it's, the conversation always starts at the exact same place. Do what you know to do. And then work on what you, what you don't know. So you know that what you're doing is, is wrong. You know, If you guys are going to be doing that, either marry or, or, or break it off, one or the other. You, you, you can't be doing this. So then once you correct the thing that you know, then God will guide you in the thing that you don't know. You see, how, see what I mean? And that's just kind of how it works. So uh, it, probably a good, good start to all this would be reading a proverb a day. Start with that. That's a great way to really get immersed. There's so much in the Bible in your life is, is so short. It's impossible to get it all before you die.
really. You're not going to run out of things in the Bible if you're really genuinely seeking. Just just keep going out and, and try to read as much as you can, because like I say, our life isn't long enough to, to get everything from the Bible. You want to get as much as you can before you go.